we welcome you to worship this Lord's Day at the First Baptist Church, Middlesboro, Kentucky. And we invite you to enter fully into worship, whether you are with us here in the sanctuary or if you're joining us by television. You're certainly welcome to be a part of this very significant worship day. I say significant because as we gather in worship today, we are joining Christians all over the world of different denominations and traditions who are celebrating this day, the day of Pentecost. There are actually three significant holy days in the Christian calendar year. Christmas, Easter, and Pentecost. We're quite familiar with the emphasis on the first two, but today we invite you to worship on this third significant day in Christian year celebration. Because a part of the Pentecost story, as you will enter into it today, a part of the Pentecost story is that people of all nations, of all tongues and cultures, are to hear the word of the Lord and to receive the coming of the Holy Spirit as those first Christians did on that first Pentecost. So we invite you to worship, to listen for the good news of Jesus Christ into your world, into your life, into your unique story. There are some announcements to share, and I call on Chalk Stapleton, co-chair of our pastor search committee. They have a report for us. Chalk. This is information for the ones of you that went at the uh, fish fry Wednesday. The pastor search committee has met two different times with a candidate for the pastor at our church. Uh, we don't know anymore really right now, just to let you know that we have met with him and his wife, and uh, we're very, very upbeat about the both of them. And uh, right now, like I say, it's the ball is in his court, and we're just kind of staying in touch and so on and so forth. So that's all we can tell you. you so if you want to hear, ask questions or whatever, we can't tell you anymore. That's all we know. So I just want to let you know that we are working and we still need you to keep us in your prayers. As you open your worship bulletin today, you will see that today is also a special emphasis on our 2013 graduates, both our high school graduates and those graduating with various degrees in higher education. I invite your attention to those names and accomplishments in the bulletin insert. This coming Wednesday, we have our regular schedule for Wednesday evening, our fellowship dinner. You're invited to come and participate. If you'd like to make a reservation, you may use the slip there inside the worship bulletin to do so. We'll have our regular prayer meeting and you'll notice that this is the last meeting before the summer break for our children's programs. Our choir will rehearse as they always do. There are opportunities immediately ahead of us. One of the big ones is Extreme Build in McCrary County, Kentucky, where we help to build a home uh, for a family in need. Uh, we will be helping the Barnett family in McCrary County this summer, and those dates are before you. There's also opportunity, if you're not able to go and participate in the labor that week, there's the opportunity to help stock the pantry or even to make a cash contribution toward the part that our church will play in that extreme build campaign this particular summer. Other dates for children and youth programs for the summer are there on the bulletin and I invite your attention to that. If you're visiting with us today, please take the slip that is there in the bulletin, fill out your contact information so that we can maintain a conversation with you following your visit today. I welcome you all to worship on this powerfully important Pentecost Sunday and you're now free to greet one another in Jesus' name.
Let's sing our praises together. Hymn number 357, O Praise the Gracious Power. Will you stand, please? we ask your blessing. For those who are suffering, touch them with your tenderness. For those who mourn, give them comfort. For those who are discouraged, give them hope. For those who celebrate graduation, rejoice with them. Open our, open our ears to hear your word and our minds to understand. Open our eyes to the wonders of your world. Pour out your loving kindness upon us. Give us a clean heart to receive your Holy Spirit unconditionally in our lives as we give thanks and praise for your gift of the Holy Spirit to guide us as we observe Pentecost today. Now, as we worship, we lift our voices in song and praise. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. We come to a time to recognize and honor our high school graduates from within our church fellowship. I invite your attention to that bulletin insert in which their names and their plans are indicated as well as their family relationships. I invite you to remember each of them, be in touch with them with your congratulations and blessings in the days ahead. Joel Benjamin Parker is with us today in worship and here uh, on the front pew. I know you'll want to extend your particular congratulations to him. At this time, we will focus 
our recognition on the litany that's printed in your bulletin, and I invite you to follow me as we read this uh, honor and recognition responsively. Let us give thanks to the Lord who guides us to face the challenges and opportunities of life. We thank you, Lord, for your leading, your encouragement, your gifts of educators and teachers, of friends and neighbors who have helped these students and encouraged them in the opportunities of life. Let us give thanks to the Lord for the families and homes into which these graduating seniors were born and have been nurtured. We are grateful, Lord, for our children and our parents, our homes and families, where they learn to grow and experience all the wonders of this life. Lord, this is a time of joy for us as we watch these graduating seniors gather before us to celebrate the completion of this phase of their education and move out from here in new directions for their lives. We ask that you would be with them as they go and strengthen them as they make on new responsibilities in this world. Give them faith and encouragement as they try to be your servants who live in joy and thankfulness for all they have received. We praise you, Lord, for all your gifts and for the opportunity to come together to celebrate this day with these graduating seniors. Thanks be to God. Amen. Our Old Testament reading today is Psalm 104. I invite your attention to these words of a very powerful psalm of God's overarching power as creator. It is the appropriate passage from the Psalms to link with the story of Pentecost experienced by the early church. Psalm 104. Bless the Lord, O my soul. O Lord, my God, you are very great. You are clothed with honor and majesty, wrapped in light as with a garment. You stretch out the heavens like a tent. 
You set the beams of your chambers on the waters. You make the clouds your chariot. You ride on the wings of the wind. You make the winds your messengers, fire and flame your ministers. You set the earth on its foundation so that it shall never be shaken. You cover it with the deep as with a garment. The waters stood above the mountains. At your rebuke, they flee. At the sound of your thunder, they take to flight. They rose up to the mountains, ran down to the valleys, to the place that you appointed for them. You set a boundary that they may not pass so that they might not again cover the earth. You make springs gush forth in the valleys. They flow between the hills, giving drink to every wild animal. The wild asses quench their thirst. By the streams, the birds of the air have their habitation. They sing among the branches. From your lofty abode, you water the mountains. The earth is satisfied with the fruit of your work. You cause the grass to grow for the cattle and plants for people to use to bring forth food from the earth and wine to gladden the human heart, oil to make the face shine and bread to strengthen the human heart. The trees of the Lord are watered abundantly, the cedars of Lebanon that he planted. In them the birds build their nest, the stork has its home in the fir trees, The high mountains are for the wild goats. The rocks are a refuge for the conies. You have made the moon to mark the seasons. The sun knows its time for setting. You make darkness and it is night when all the animals of the forest come creeping out. The young lions roar for their prey, seeking their food from God. When the sun rises, they withdraw and lie down in their dens. People go out to their work and to their labor until the evening. O Lord, how manifold are your works. In wisdom you have made them all. The earth is full of your creatures. Yonder is the sea, great and wide. Creeping things innumerable are there, living things both small and great. There go the ships and Leviathan that you formed to sport in it. These all look to you to give them their food in due season. When you give to them, they gather it up. When you open up your hand, they are filled with good things. When you hide your face, they are dismayed. When you take away their breath, they die and return to their dust. When you send forth your spirit, they are created, and you renew the face of the ground. May the glory of the Lord endure forever. May the Lord rejoice in his works who looks on the earth and it trembles, who touches the mountains and they smoke. I will sing to the Lord as long as I live. I will sing praise to my God while I have being. May my meditation be pleasing to him, for I rejoice in the Lord. Let sinners be consumed from the earth and let the wicked be no more. Bless the Lord, O my soul. Praise the Lord. May we pray together. Dear God, we come to your house today, a building dedicated in your name for worship and praise. We come to acknowledge you as creator of everything as personal savior of our own life story and as guide for our uncertain futures. We come acknowledging you as the God who is in powerful control and yet who asks us to take responsibility for our own decisions, for our own lives, for our own stewardship. And just as those first disciples gathered to celebrate and pray on Pentecost, we also unite this morning in prayer for situations and people in your good world. We admit that often we feel so helpless and hopeless and don't know how or what to pray. But Holy Spirit, 
help our hearts to be open to you, trusting that you will intercede for us in sighs and groanings that are too deep for words to express. And so today, through your spirit, we pray. We pray for families, and we thank you for so many homes surrounded by loving people that produce such fine graduates. We pray for those without families, for those without homes, for those whose family relationships are broken. We pray for those who feel lost and alone. And our prayer is that they would know the love of your Holy Spirit and the hope that you bring. We pray for those suffering with mental and physical illness and with injury. Thank you for people who care, who support and listen. We pray for those who feel alone in their illness. We pray for their healing and their peace of mind. We pray for all those who are living with illness. May they know the faithfulness of your Holy Spirit and the hope that you bring. We pray for victims of discrimination and bullying. And we thank you for courageous people who stand up to injustice and who take a stand against prejudice. We pray for those who live in fear, for those who don't feel valued, for those being denied justice and grace. We pray for all who experience hatred. May they know the kindness of your Holy Spirit and the hope that you bring. We pray for those places in our world that are even in this moment living in war and violence. We thank you for people and organizations who work tirelessly for peace and for those willing to risk their lives for others' safety. We pray for people who live in fear of their own lives and their families' lives, for communities that have been ripped apart, where futures seem hopeless. We pray for these threatened people across our world. May they know the peace of your Holy Spirit and the hope that you bring. We pray for your children and each of their futures. Thank you for all those who encourage and care for young people. We pray for those young people who have limited or no access to education and to opportunity. And we pray that you give them wisdom and passion and be especially with those who work with them. We pray for your children in our country and across the world. May they know the joy of your Holy Spirit and the hope that you bring. God, use us as your instruments of peace and love and kindness and joy. From this worship service on Pentecost Sunday, send us out to be your agents of healing and grace under the power of the Holy Spirit. As we follow Jesus and listen to the lead of his spirit, we recommit ourselves in the words that he taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. This is our time in worship that we center on our children. If you're one of our children, please come down. Let's talk a little while. I'm going to turn on my fan. 
It's really warm up here when I wear this robe. It's really warm. So I'm going to turn it on. That's going to cool me off a little bit. Do you like a fan? Do you notice it looks different in worship today? Something different in the sanctuary? Did you see anything? What is it? Is it a color? It is a color. You notice there's red up there and there's red right here because we're talking about Pentecost today. Don's already told you a little bit about Pentecost, hasn't he? Well, in the Bible, Pentecost, the um, word in the Bible for Holy Spirit is wind. That's funny, isn't it? And you hear, hear this fan right here and you can hear the wind. Can you see the wind? Anybody see it? I don't think so. But I think... Put this little streamer on here. Let's see what happens. Let's do that. I can hold my microphone. Don't say too much. Yeah, turn it on. What do you think is going to happen? Now you know there's wind because it's evidence, isn't it? It's not, we don't see the wind, but we see what evidence is. If you go outside and you see someone with a kite, you can tell if there's wind because the kite's up in the air. Or if you see the trees and they go back and forth and the leaves move, you can see the evidence of the wind, right? So we really can't see the wind. Well, a, the wind came when it was Pentecost in the Bible. They were meeting because all those disciples, all those friends of Jesus were sad because he was gone and they were hoping, they, they prayed just like we do, they went to church. And they sat, and they were praying, and they were reading, and this wind came in. And that was the Holy Spirit. And it was kind of like, what's going on? We don't understand this. Well, the next thing that they ask is, how do, how do we talk about this Holy Spirit? What is this Holy Spirit? And they said, well, you can't really see it, but you can see evidence of the Holy Spirit. Do you remember when Allison taught us a scripture from Galatians? And she said, the fruit of the Spirit, remember the big bowl of fruit? The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, Peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. She had that big bowl of fruit. And that's how people can know whether God is in our hearts. Because he's showing love through us when you love each other, especially sisters or moms and dads you love. Or if you're showing kindness to someone at school. Or if you say, I'm really mad, but you don't get mad at somebody. You say, I'm going to be self-controlled. I'm not going to get mad about this. You're showing that Jesus is in your heart and you love them. That's how we show, just like this right here shows, the wind. Let's pray. God, you love us very much. Thank you that you come and live with us and help us to be like Jesus as we show the wind in us. Amen. Our hymn of stewardship is number 226, Wind Who Makes All Winds Blow. And let's stand together to sing.
us pray. God, giver of all gifts, of all goodness, we thank you. We want to be more thankful. We want to praise you more. Teach us that. Blow through us. Let us show those gifts of the Spirit as we go out each day. In your name we pray. Amen.
And so we turn to the book of the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 2, the story of that first day of Christian Pentecost, Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 21. When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place. And suddenly from heaven there came a sound like the rush of a violent wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. Divided tongues as of fire appeared among them, and a tongue rested on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as the Spirit gave them ability. Now there were devout Jews from every nation under heaven living in Jerusalem. And at this sound, the crowd gathered and was bewildered because each one heard them speaking in the native language of each. Amazed and astonished, they ask, are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of us in our own native language? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs. In our own languages, we hear them speaking about God's deeds of power. All were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, What does this mean? But others sneered and said, They're filled with new wine. But Peter, standing with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed them. Men of Judea and all who live in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and listen to what I say. Indeed, these are not drunk, as you suppose, for it is only nine o'clock in the morning. No, this is what was spoken through the prophet Joel. In the last days it will be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Even upon my slaves, both men and women, in those days I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show portents in the heaven above, and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and smoky mist. The sun shall be turned to darkness, and the moon to blood, before the coming of the Lord's great and glorious day. Then everyone who calls on the name of the Lord, shall be saved. And so we come to the culmination of Eastertide, the 50th day after Easter, the early church had been listening to the resurrected Jesus teach and instruct, guide and encourage them for 40 days. And then with his ascension to heaven, they spent 10 days in a prayer vigil, waiting as he commanded, waiting for the Holy Spirit. Today we celebrate the culmination of their experience and we anticipate the coming of the Spirit into our lives and our witness. You see what was happening in Jerusalem then was that the Jewish feast of Pentecost which had been kept for centuries by faithful Jews was being celebrated in the city and the coming of the Holy Spirit of the risen Jesus came in and overrode that ancient Jewish festival and gave it new meaning. The Jews were there in Jerusalem from all over the world. 
They were there for the festival to celebrate the giving of the Torah law on Mount Sinai to Moses and then to celebrate the harvest, the bringing in of the sheaves of God's blessing over creation. But here on this particular Jewish Pentecost celebration, the one right after Jesus' resurrection, we have a group of unlearned Galilean fishermen and other tradesmen who are not speaking in their native Aramaic of Galilee. But when they spoke, they were heard by all of those pilgrims from all of those nations that Luke listed in the story. They are heard in their own language. To all, this was clearly a manifestation of the Holy Spirit of God. But it's something radically new, even for Judaism. Judaism didn't make it an order to go out and proselytize and bring other people in. No, you were born into the covenant of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Judaism didn't expand its arms and open its wings ever so much. But here is Christianity from the get-go realizing that it must aim at the whole world, at all races and all tongues, never content to be a religion held by the few. This is for all of humanity. This is the good news of God in Christ, crucified, dead, and resurrected. Slaves, men, women, young, old, domestic and foreign, citizen and one from far away, all, all will be included in the good news. All will be entrusted to preach it to the ends of the earth. Sharon Blizzard invites us into this story. She says, take another pass at this narrative and let yourself be transported back to that first century event. Imagine that you're in Jerusalem in that place with Peter and the other apostles. It's a busy time, this Jewish festival, lots of -of out-of-towners scattering and milling around. And these faithful Jews have come from all over the empire, converged on Jerusalem to celebrate this significant festival. Maybe you're one of them. Maybe you've come from a long distance, and maybe you speak a different language. But you're hungry to hear more about this new thing concerning Jesus. Some say that he is Mashiach. So you want to know more from these disciples of his. And then suddenly the wind of the Holy Spirit fills the place. You hear the roar of it as it rushes through the place. What else are you hearing? What else can you see? What do you smell? What are you feeling? Everything's crazy. People come running in to see what's happening. A cacophony erupts. Excited voices are speaking in many different languages. And then an amazed silence blankets the room. The disciples begin to speak. And it's amazing because each person hears the message in his or her own language. You too can hear the message plainly in your language and you're amazed. The words make perfect sense to you. Is it a miracle or are they all drunk? Is it a holy happening? Is it the realization of prophecy? Yes, it's a holy moment. The people heard the good news in many languages. But the common language they all understood was love. My friend Molly Marshall, theology professor at Central Baptist Seminary, points us to the great Catholic saint Ignatius of Loyola, Back in the 1500s, he made this statement, Go, 
set the world on fire and in flame. He wasn't speaking literally about becoming a pyromaniac. He was the founder of the Society of Jesus. We know them as the Jesuits, and the new pope is a member of that order. From the 1500s forward, the Jesuits went out into the world. Maybe you've seen the film, The Mission. They went out into those areas of the globe that the explorers had found and discovered and began to colonize. And the Jesuits went on an ardent mission. They became a movement to proclaim grace and forgiveness, to take the good news of Christ to parts of the world previously unknown. They wanted to say what those first disciples were saying. God loves you. God wants you to be at peace with him and with one another. And so in the spirit of 2,000 years of church history, we hark back to that first day of Pentecost and churches like ours who celebrate this day as a Christian festival We wear red. It looks like Beth and I are about to catch fire ourselves with this red cloth up here. That's on purpose to remind us of the fire, the flame, the power of the Spirit of God. There are denominational families in the Christian family of God. There are denominational groups that believe that the manifestation of the coming of the Spirit issues forth in the speaking of tongues, and this is one of the powerful passages that they cite. Others of us believe it's not necessary for that to be the ultimate expression of the Spirit within us and speaking out of us to the world. But we all need to be careful that we don't tell God what God can do with the Holy Spirit and how the Spirit might work. It's clear that God is not through transforming this world in all of its need, in all of its brokenness, in all of its divisions, in all of its violence. God is not through transforming this world through the instruments of his spirit-led sons and daughters. That's what Peter was saying in his sermon that day. When he got the crowd settled down, when the hush blanketed the room, Peter interpreted the event in the light of the Old Testament prophet, Joel. He quotes the prophet and says, Certainly this is an unusual event, but it shouldn't necessarily surprise us because we've been, we Jews have been expecting this kind of visitation for a long time. The significance of this day is not in the flashiness of the fire or the roar of the tongues and the languages. The significance of this day is in the message itself. The spirit of Jesus rests upon his followers and he gives them voice to bear witness each in his or her own way. What Jesus had done for them, they would now go out and tell it. My students always respond when I say in class, can I get a witness? Pentecost was the sending of the Spirit upon the people of God so that the world could get a witness, so that God's sons and daughters would go out and tell it, tell it, tell it all in every language, tell it in every way, in every action, and so that all the world could see God in us. When the Spirit of Jesus rests upon us, we will find our voice and we will speak the good news message. And sometimes we will use words. Peter was saying that the day had come for God's people to bear witness. What a powerful day it was. And what a powerful day it is. 
in this 21st century as we seek to be God's people, preaching, witnessing, sharing with our world today. Bill Wilson is the president of the Center for Congregational Health in Winston-Salem. And in the column that he posted on Friday, he contrasts the typical American lifestyle choice between that which is successful and that which is significant. Bill cites the book by Bob Buford. Some of you may know this book. It's entitled Halftime, Moving from Success to Significance. Bob Buford wrote the book after his midlife crisis, and he observed in his own story what is true for many of us, that we come to a point in our life when we realize that we have been in the futile pursuit of success when what we desperately need is significance. Bill Whistlin, because he's in an organization that helps churches, says, you know, not only individuals, but congregations have that problem sometimes. We do the things to bring about success. We do the things to get bigger or more comfortable, but we're dooming ourselves to frustration and irrelevance. Let me quote Bill. Congregations that are self-absorbed find that they can never provide enough of anything. There's always an appetite for more programs, facilities, or events that never quite satisfy our hunger for entertainment or for nourishment. The staff are here to meet our expectations, and when they do, we take great pride in them, but when they do not, we critique them with brutal attacks. I believe we're called instead to give ourselves to something of great significance. God has called us to join him in creating nothing less than his kingdom work here on earth. And sometimes we may pray without thinking, thy kingdom come, thy will be done here on earth as it is in heaven. But when we give ourselves fully to that significant task, real success is inevitable. Bill goes on to describe the fact that in May we anticipate in many of our churches groups going out on summer mission projects around the region or around the world. And of course, I thought about Extreme Build coming up soon for us. Bill says, when those mission teams return, what their congregations will hear in those mission reports sounds something like this. I didn't really know what to expect, but I went anyway. The food was strange, but I ate it anyway. The people were different, but I loved them anyway. The idea of helping others in Jesus' name was new to me, but I tried it anyway. I am a different person than when I left here. I am so thankful to be part of something that truly makes a difference, something that is actually significant. We have to work against our American lifestyles and our core values in secular society that would entice us to pursue success when what we really want is significance. Our mission projects remind us of what the work and life of the kingdom is really like. It's less about us and more about others. It's focused not on what we want, but upon what God needs us to do. It's more interest in serving than being served and giving away rather than getting. Jesus made it pretty clear and simple. You find your life when you give yourself away. 
Can I get a witness? Your young men shall see visions. Your old men shall dream dreams. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. It means preach, which means give a witness. Sometimes with words. Our own sons and daughters are graduating. And going out from this place of home and church and nurture and growth to significant places in their world. And Julie and Joel and others listed, but you're here. Julie and Joel, daughter and son of this church. Go with our blessing. Go with our prayers. Make a significant difference as Jesus makes a difference in you. And may we all go with tongues of flame and the power of the wind of the Spirit. Can I get a witness? The hymn of opportunity and commitment is hymn number 229. Let every Christian pray. I invite you to sing these words as your own dedication. If you have a decision that you want to make, you may make it there in your pew in your own privacy before God. Or you may choose to come and share it with us for our encouragement and so that we might promise to support you at this point in your journey. As we sing these words, may they be your commitment. Hymn number 229, may we stand and sing. sending him sweet, sweet spirit there in your bulletin. May you go feeling the spark of the creator within you, kindling the light of Christ in all those whom you encounter, and allowing the gentle breath of the spirit to sustain and inspire you. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen.